I thought we'd start off with a, a little exploration of what does the term empowerment actually mean? What terms do you associate with the word empowerment? So I'd like to invite you to take out your phones if you want and go to menti.com and then enter the code uh, which is at the top of the screen here. Uh, so 47760779. Um, and that should give you a chance to just um, add anything that comes to mind when you hear the word empowerment. Um, and then we will hopefully create a little word cloud here um, as, we're, as we're kind of going through this webinar. So um, whilst you're doing this, I would just like to mention that I'm really delighted uh, to have a few um, guest speakers who are going to share uh, some of their practice examples with us. Um, so I've got Joe Gipp and June McDonald from Renfrewshire County, uh, Renfrewshire County uh, with us. Uh, we've got Georgina Kitt from Blackpool Advocacy Hub, which is part of Empowerment, um, and Cecile Romy, who is doing her PhD at the UCL Institute of Education uh, with Professor Claire Cameron and Professor Pat Petrie. So um, we should have a fascinating conversation ahead of us. And um, I'm sure we'll also have plenty of opportunity to hear from you um, about yeah, what, what empowerment means to you and in your practice. Um, so I'm very curious to see what you've come up with here in terms of the, the words you associate with empowerment. Um, what we can see coming through here is very much based on autonomy, strength, confidence. Um, so we'll see opportunity, um, agency is starting to become more important here as well. Um, in the word cloud, independence, um, control, freedom. Um, so we will revisit that in a little moment. Um, in the meantime, I will just briefly give you an introduction of the webinar structure for this morning, which is that I'm going to very briefly talk about empowerment. Then we'll have a little fishbowl discussion with uh, Georgina, Cecile, June and Joe, and then go into a wider exploration. Um, so to give you a super quick run through empowerment theory, um, I think empowerment theory in a nutshell grapples with the question of how can we help individuals and communities tackle the systemic oppression and societal barriers that prevent them from unfolding their full potential. So we're thinking about empowerment theory, both in the way we work with individuals, but also in the way we would work with groups or whole communities. Um, and in a sense, it ranges um, in a spectrum from trying to support the individual, trying to help them develop human agency help them develop a sense of identity, a sense of self-efficacy and control, um, that sense that they can actually change their own circumstances, uh, their ability to cope with whatever life might throw at them, to cope with the uncertainty in life and to feel more empowered in their own individual life. So that's one important aspect around empowerment. And it points at the thing that we can't do that for people, we can't empower people we can create the conditions in which people feel more empowered, are able to take up more power, develop their own agency. But we need to be quite clear that we don't empower others. We create the conditions, we create the environment in which they empower themselves. The other important bit about empowerment is that um, we also need to think about sort of the wider social aspect to it. And it has to do with what uh, Paulo Freire term, uh, has termed conscientization. So this idea that we need to make people attuned to social inequalities. We need to help them recognize and challenge the social inequalities and the fact that power is really unevenly distributed, that that kind of uneven distribution leads to exploitation and leads to um, oppression. Um, and so we need to help support groups um, to transform the status quo rather than just to kind of deal with the status quo and feel a little bit better about it. So 
that's kind of the more um, radical um, aspect around empowerment in a sense. Um, and I think more broadly, we really need to change the, the narrative we have around power because too often we use power as a way to control others rather than as responsibility for, uh, for each other. So in a sense, we need to move from, from what uh, Charles Letby calls um, whether power works in the name of love and generosity or anger and hostility. And I think we very much need to think about how can we bring love and power together and what might that mean? Um, so I strongly recommend, um, if you haven't already, um, to check out the Australian Centre for Social Innovations uh, report called When Love Meets Power, because I think it has some really interesting um, thoughts and practice examples about how that can be done, how to bring together love and power. Um, and in that sense, I think um, I'm very much with uh, Martin Luther King, um, who has this amazing quote and talks about that we often contrast the concepts of love and power as opposites, as polar opposites, so that love is identified with the resignation of power and power with a denial of love. And we've got to get this right. What's needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. So with that being said, um, I would like to invite you to hear from um, our first two um, contributors, Joe and June, who work um, in a children's home in Renfrewshire Council. Um, so I'll pass over to them to tell us a little bit more about what does empowerment look like in their practice and to give us a little example about the links to creativity and learning and being alongside the journey. Thanks, Thanks Gabriel. So my name is Joe Gibb, I'm the house manager. Uh, for one of the children's houses in, in Renfrewshire, as Gabriel was saying, and the back of context to social pedagogy in Renfrewshire for the last the past six years, uh, Renfrewshire Council has been working alongside Tempra in terms of you know using the social pedagogy perspective to essentially empower the, the care staff and the young people and children and families. So we're still pretty much on that journey. Um, to the extent now where um, Renfrewshire has now um, enabled four managers to start the Masters in Social Pedagogy Leadership at UCLan as well. So there's a real investment in social pedagogy from Renfrewshire's perspective. Um, so basically, this, this short presentation is about, I suppose, June's journey in terms of supporting a young person. And I suppose a bit about me as the manager, I basically empowered June to, to start that process. Uh, and the interesting thing is June's a night shift worker. And it kind of usually, it kind of goes against the kind of, your know, general kind of perception of what your night shift workers do. So it's a really interesting you know, journey that June and the young person has been on. So I'll pass you over to, to June. And I'll unmute now. Well, good morning, everyone. I can only see Joe here. Uh, as Joe said, I'm a night shift worker. Uh, I only joined this team 16 weeks ago. So it was all about relationship building to start with. But being on the social pedagogy and having a community learning background, we were given a flower as part of the exercise about goal setting. And I was working with a young person who was disengaging with life, disengaging, didn't want to engage with MD. And she was ready to finish college. And as a team, we recognised that we needed to engage on something over the summer period to make sure she was still engaged for the, the future learning. So I looked at having a goal setting bureau and I watched this young person doodling doing artwork, doing various different things. And I thought, idea, uh, this led me to invite her to uh, come up with this mural for goal setting for the house. Uh, we looked at what I looked to achieve from it, what the house looked to achieve from it, and what she felt she could input. So this led us to decide we would have a goal setting mural that could be changed in a weekly basis, a monthly basis. There would be structured parts and there would also be chalk face parts that young people could 
design themselves to put their goals in. And as a team, we would then be able to look at the goals and take them from there and plan with the young person how to do them. So our first goal for the young person and I, that was our first goal to complete this goal we had set. So her and I set, and being a night shift worker, as Joe said, I would be decided what we needed to achieve it. We go, we buy a canvas, but if I got there in the daytime, I was in a bed, so it was a chap up waiting in there. That was about me going out of my comfort zone, I work night shift and making sure I was available within the day shift to support her. We planned what resources we need, we, what we wanted in it, and then, as I said, uh, we continued to plan, replan, revisit. We then bought the materials and a few young people and different things are saying that will never happen, this will never happen. But it was all about me having the opportunities when she disengaged with the, the task that she could re-engage with. We're still in the process of completing this goal, but the girl drew the flowers. We then it disengaged, I went back, I revisited it. But for me, it was just, it was very important that the young people could have a place to show their voice within the house. The house could have a voice. People entering the house knew what goals these young people were working on. There was no mix-up of what goals they were working on. It's there visually for them to see. The ownership of that mural is not mine. It's the young people's. She said, but if you look at the bottom of that, there is a path up that petal, and it's got lots of music notes. And what we find within our house with these young people, if we're not fine-tuning at all times, all areas are goal-setting for young people, they struggle to achieve the goals. So for us, it was just, for me, this was a very creative way. We can use it for team meetings, house goals, the catering staff have agreed to use it, the young people, the new young people entering the house when they leave can re redesign this so it can be an ongoing, evolving thing. We actually have a individual goal setting a, a boards to go with us. So that will take the whole goal off of that on a plan of how to achieve it. And we can reevaluate it, we can revisit it at any time. I hope I'm not waffling here, but for us, for young people, for empowering for me, it's just about ongoing revisiting what skills are developing, how they're using, putting them into practice, and how we can facilitate creative ways of them doing that. So yeah, thanks for your time, and I hope that was me. Uh, no. was <clears throat> enough. I suppose another, another thing to add is that, you know, that this process is, you know, in terms of using the learning zone model, you could see, you know, on the, where we are on the journey, you know, sometimes uh, the young person's been in, the comfort, in her comfort zone, yep. she's come in, in her learning zone, she's never been in the panic zone, which has been great, but it's been really a, a journey in and mm. out, whereby that scaffold's been either kind of quite high or quite yep. low, but we've kind of went at the young person's pace, which is really, really important in terms of, you know, no forcing the issue and making sure that it becomes really authentic in terms of that kind of mm -hmm. that whole notion of how mm -hmm. um, But really, I'm really impressed mm -hmm. with, you know, the uh, June's commitment to this, uh, you know, especially as, as the manager, you know, empowering June to take this project, which came off the back of uh, a course that June yeah. was on with FEMPRA, whereby they were given a task yeah. in terms of to, to, to incorporate it into their kind of daily practice. So essentially, June has done a fantastic job, and I'm really, really pleased. Um, so I hope that's been useful. That. Thanks, thanks to June, and I'll pass you back here to Gabriel. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Um, that sounds really fascinating, and I think what really stands out for me is that you you recognised um, this girl's skill and ability to be artistic and to express herself in that way, and you gave her kind of an opportunity to kind of take that to the next level. And both to develop her own skill, which is an empowering thing, but also to give her that greater sense of ownership and take responsibility for, yeah. for the entire uh, yeah. home that she lives in. And I think that's that's beautiful as well, because it links very much to when, when we help people kind of take power and use it for the greater good, we're, we're achieving amazing things. Um, and it's, it's lovely to see how she's kind of also taken the metaphor of the flower and kind of incorporated her own thoughts into what's important 
to us here in order to to make this a place where everybody feels empowered um june i'm i'm interested um uh, to hear from you like how important is it to you as a member of staff to feel empowered in order to be able to do that yourself with the young people for me it's very important i've uh, had a lot of moves in the last couple of years and i've only met joe 10 weeks ago he joined as my new manager so it was good for me to have ideas and somebody to recognize my skill set i have a very uh, passion about literacies and that's mm -hmm. everyday literacies the social practice model what is useful to young people and my for me that's been my route out of poverty my whole life and for these young people if they can recognize what skills they have to develop and the small smart steps they need to achieve these goals they'll, they'll always be and as you said that this young person has a real art flair for art and that she can turn her hand to that artistic flair her whole life and it's about her recognizing that yeah fantastic center mm -hmm. our very warm wishes and um yeah extend our thanks for yeah. for doing this piece of work with you that's mm -hmm. been fantastic to hear about thanks we'll mm -hmm. come back to that um in yeah. a little while um i'm keen next to to hear from georgina who is working with the blackpool advocacy hub because i think her work kind of links very much into sort of the more structured the the in-depth approach of like how can we make sure that we we represent people who might struggle to find their voice how can we make sure that we represent them well how can we make sure that we understand what's important to them um so georgina i'll hand over to you thanks gabe so interestingly enough that the umbrella organization that i work for is actually called empowerment uh, which is quite fitting for today. Um, so for us, empowerment's a family of people that have come together because we passionately believe that we can make things better. Um, and empowerment is on, on the side of the people uh, that we work for, but we don't deliver the services uh, to the person. We, are, we think that we work alongside the person. And that fits very well with uh, Blackpool Advocacy Hub, which is the organisation that I actually work for because advocacy is all about working alongside the person, um, sort, of, sort of working alongside with and not doing to. Um, so I'm just going to explain sort of how we feel empowerment fits into that. So for all advocacy, there should be really a, a three-part meeting. So we always meet the person before uh, the meeting. And we always, when we're talking about the people that we represent, we say, the person or the name of the person we don't call them a service user um, and we don't use that terminology because we like to represent the person as being a person and being a whole um, so we always uh, meet the person beforehand and get their views and their wishes and say uh, and, and find out what they want to talk about within the meeting um, find out whether they want us to talk about it in the meeting, whether they want to talk about it in the meeting, or whether they want to be able to flip from them to us, um, so that they're empowered to say how much of a role they want to take part in that meeting. Because what we, we find quite often is that they feel very disempowered in the meetings around um, professionals, and that quite often before they've had an advocate that they felt very disempowered in a room full of professionals um so we're very led by uh, building up relationships beforehand and listening to the views and wishes of the person um and we go as slow as the person wants to go um and it can be weeks and weeks and weeks before the person feels that they're able to say anything in the meetings and it's about us letting the person say how often they want to speak or don't want to speak um and we we just take our lead from the person at all steps 
and it can be that they change the mind once we're in the second part of the meeting so we've had the first meeting where we've got all their views and wishes and that we've wrote them down ready for the the second meeting which is the actual meeting if that makes sense so we've had the pre-meet and then we've got the actual meeting with the professionals so we go in and they might have, have had a complete change of heart where they might have felt okay going in to speak to the person and then they might feel disempowered or they might feel empowered enough to speak once they get in there but we've got all their notes um and they might say i want to speak or i don't want to speak but we're organized uh, enough for them to to change their mind or not once they're in that meeting um and i've had meetings where the person's actually left because they felt so stressed in that meeting but we've had everything that they want to say there and we've been able to ensure that all their views and wishes have been able to be said um so that, that they're able to still get their views and wishes said in that meeting even whether they're not there um or they have took complete control and said actually i don't need you to say anything because today on this day i feel empowered enough to to do this because you're sat here by my side and i actually felt better than i thought i was going to feel um so it's all about them being able to decide how they feel on the day with an advocate and they're able to make that decision by themselves and then we have a third meeting where depending on what well, we always have the third meeting anyway but depending on how the meeting's gone we will debrief them and see how they felt and have they got any questions or anything that they want us to further do from that meeting so we're always checking all the way through how they're doing and if there's anything they want us to do on all three of those meetings and we've had some times where actually depending on where they are on the process they decide they do or don't want an advocate anymore because they've actually felt empowered enough to not need an advocate to voice things for them anymore or something's changed within the journey so i worked with somebody where they didn't feel that their clinician listened to them at all and we worked with them to have their clinician changed and then I worked with them for a while after they'd had a clinician change and their new clinician was great with them or the problems that they were having before weren't happening and they actually said actually Georgie things are great now I don't need you anymore and we're always working to not be needed as, as advocates we're always working alongside somebody to not be needed because as an advocate you want somebody to be able to advocate for themselves and that's the best thing you can hear is that you're not needed um and that's everything from me thanks georgina that's that's a lovely example and yeah it, it shows that our role isn't necessarily to be needed at all times um uh, what I'm curious about is you, you mentioned the, the meetings, so the, the main meetings that you would have with the people you support. And um, I think I can see how your approach it feels very empowering to the people uh, you, you support. Um, I'm wondering what you can do in those meetings to support someone in feeling empowered, because um, obviously it also depends on how other professionals um, interact in those meetings? I think it's difficult because you're always led by the person. So it depends what support the person wants. So if they've, if they've literally said, I want to take the role unless I like defer to you, you're led by the person. So it's quite difficult as an advocate because you're only allowed to do as much as you're allowed to do in relation to what the person wants you to do so sometimes it's really quite a difficult role to have um it's, your discussions beforehand are really important with the person to say you know at what point do you want me to step in you know do you want me to step in if this happens that happens you, your discussions and your relationship build up with the person are really really important and really really key 
because if you don't know your person you don't know what they want you can overstep with them and then they might be really unhappy that you've assumed that they want you to do something and as an advocate you can never assume something because you might have spoiled something if that makes sense and they might not have wanted you to have done that um which is why it's so important for your pre-preparation before the meeting yeah that makes sense thanks very much georgie um cecile i'm eager to to hear your thoughts on empowerment and how we use power and this idea that maybe sometimes it's best not to do anything so mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you, Gabriel. And I think like listening to um, June, Joe and Georgina, actually, I realized when you did your presentation, Gabriel, you were talking about human agency and then consensual. And I think in German, I think there is this distinction between um, community and society. And I think the, the examples that June and Joe were giving and Georgina were giving, it was very much about within the community, within the group of people that are around, how can we help that person feel more comfortable to do that? Uh, but I think then where consensual comes in, it's about society as a whole and kind of much like deeper um, structural uh, questions. And I think they all, I think it's important to see how they relate to each other. Uh, and I was, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, what I prepared. So um, when I was thinking about what I um, was going to talk about, I was watching um, the movie, who did the movie? It's Malcolm X and the autobiography of Malcolm X. And actually there is a moment in that movie where Malcolm X is kind of walking in a university and he's gonna go and give a talk. Uh, and he is with this group of uh, people um that that are kind of coming to him and there is this white woman uh who looks very middle class she has a little beret she has long blonde hair and she has a little notebook and then she comes and she in she interrupts and she says, uh, malcolm i really really admire what what you're doing how can i help you how how can i support your cause and he hardly ever stops and hardly ever talks to her and he said nothing um and i think that's 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 really really um a good thing to remember when is it that uh there are moments when actually because of who we are because of our position in society maybe it's better to do nothing so we still need to kind of understand how uh, and why and the reason that kind of puts us as an individual in that position where we can't do um we can't really do anything and so if you look at this triangle, the kind of usual idea we have around power is somebody at the very top there that has lots of underlings and that get people to do what they want. But actually, if we want to empower people, we would like the um, triangle to be turned upside down. Isn't it? That would be wonderful if the people that are you know the majority are actually at the top uh, and have the most power but if we do that that's a very 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 unstable position to be in and the triangle will tip over and in all that however if we kind of is that working yes it is working if we kind of uh put props around on the triangle my computer is very slow then hopefully it will stabilize it, that's it. And actually the, the, the triangle can stand upright. And what are those things that make the triangle kind of stay upright? So for example, um, in, in, this, uh, in an example where Georgina, you were talking about, you know, those people in the meeting, well, if they feel empowered, actually, the meeting itself is putting people in very specific positions. So they may be the professional. The professional have their trainings. They have in the in the in the UK the way we talk about the way things are now. Very often, it's because you can actually pay for your studies. 
that you can you can access this training if somehow you don't have access to to the money to pay for your training you won't be able so already there is a kind of a, a differential in power in that it may be uh in terms of uh, gender as as a woman if you're expected to be caring and loving and then you suddenly go and say well i don't care about about other people i just want to think about myself you may actually have reactions that are quite different so the kind of assumption and expectation that people about have about who you are puts you in a different position so um i think all those kind of um things that that help to hold the triangle uh, uh upside down and all those assumptions if we say maybe the best thing to do when we want to empower people from a kind of a bigger structural way is to do nothing. What, what is still important to do, I think, is to kind of try and in every situation understand the things that are putting the triangle upside down so that actually we come and we do things more consciously. Uh, and I just want to say, this is not my idea. <laughs> I've been using um, other people. It's, uh, and it's, so the, I put the link there of the triangle and it's a kind of a training for change, which is a, a group of uh, trainers uh, that, that work for social justice and, and radical change. And I just want to um, make sure that you know about that because again, I'm not that important in that. It's the, it's the idea and it's the network of people that is much more important. And I think, that's kind of an idea of also part of turning the power triangle upside down. So I think that's it. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, Cecile. That's really thought provoking. Uh, could you also put the link to that in, in chat, please, so that people can check it out in their own time? Um, so, I mean, that's been that's been quite rich in terms of all sorts of aspects around empowerment that we have covered so far. Um, I was thinking just now, maybe the most empowering thing that we can do is to create the conditions in which you can talk with each other. Um, so I'm going to put you into breakout rooms for 10 minutes to just um, share your reflections or experiences of um, working with empowerment. Um, in whichever context you work in, and then we'll come back for a little um, sort of round of uh, debriefs. Here we are all back. So I hope you um, enjoyed the opportunity to um, have more of a conversation about empowerment and obviously get to know each other because we also heard that it's all about relationships. Um, so I'm keen to, to hear from you any kind of things that stood out from your conversations, anything that you feel like we haven't actually explored just yet around empowerment feel free to unmute yourself and share it. i was just I, I was just kind of i kind of suppose conscious of the fact that i i think in terms of my role i'm always thinking as a manager and you know it's something that really kind of comes out dig and it's the first thing that comes out of my mouth these days is the kind of managerial protect yourself at all times you know rhetoric and it's horrible it's, I, I feel quite bad. I'm going to need to get some counselling because you know that kind of whole social justice justice aspect of working with vulnerable people. You kind of become a bit numb to that, whereby you know what the kind of ram, you know what the ramifications are in a high risk profession such as residential care, residential child care. And if you get it wrong, you're done. You know, it's as simple as that. So when you're empowering people, it's really important. For for me, that there's a if you're using that kind of scaffold metaphor to make sure that the scaffolds there at the right you know at the right size to provide the right support to enable people to be empowered safely and i think that's something for me that i'm really quite aware of mm -hmm. and i it strikes me that one of the things we do as professionals or one of the things we should be aiming to do is to connect people with resources so in your case joe you freed up june to get the resources to do the art. So I think we can get into this thing where we see changes all or nothing, but little little things can lead to bigger things. And um, in our group, I just kind of <laughs> mentioned that my touchstone in social pedagogy, because trying to say, right, am I doing this is what helps me as a touchstone and everyone will have their own touchstone so this isn't a kind of tablet of stone 
but for me it works is thinking of Hamelainen's quote that social pedagogy is seeking to decisively influence an individual's relationship to society and I think that's a good kind of touchstone to have because it places the worker in a in a role where we're trying to create power for the person we work with we're not trying to be power up we're not going to trying to take all the credit or um get power for ourselves and uh another thing um couple of things in holland in in denmark they talk about working outside in and i think june kind of explained that that idea of creating change by focusing on something outside that then empowers the way the person feels about themselves and that links to gabrielle's piece on consciousness and Freire. and then the other thing i'll just quickly say is basilios who some of you will know in greece talks about starting with two dots the social pedagogue and the young person and building a series of dots for the young person a series of connections for the young person whatever they are and then coming back to georgina's point withdrawing because what he says is the web now is self-sustaining and it doesn't need the pedagogue anymore and again i find that a very useful way of thinking about the way we work yeah absolutely um yeah you've made some really fascinating points there jamil um i'm wondering catherine we had some really interesting conversations about because you you were saying that you, you you're sometimes a bit critical of of using the term empowerment and that that there is a certain element of convenience or laziness that sometimes comes with it i wonder do you want to say more about that yeah sorry my my internet connection is unstable so if i'm uh, if i disappear off that that's why um i guess i was i was just saying that i um i feel a bit like i use the term empowerment or to empower people um in quite a lazy way in that it's become part of my um vernacular i suppose and i i just i kind of i don't use it without think with, with thinking about it properly anymore um and so that was sort of why i i came on the the webinar to really try and understand what i mean by that and particularly kind of in a social pedagogical context so i think the thing that that i sort of i really appreciated well appreciated everybody's um input um was was that idea gabriel that you said at the beginning about we don't empower others we create the conditions in which people empower themselves and i love the the imagery and the metaphor of the of the scaffolding um to do that um and i think yeah the different roles that we all have um joe and june your your roles with kind of implementing that so so joe was it you that kind of went and bought the poles and the um and the bolts and stuff and june was it you that like put it up mm -hmm. around that person like what like what we've all kind of got a different role to play there i suppose um to to help people to to succeed um and be empowered um you know, for whatever that means um yeah thanks catherine um that's really really a nice way to to develop that metaphor further Fantastic. Any any more thoughts that people would like to share? Uh, just go, I could just jump in again quite quickly. Just start about about Paulo Freire and the kind of banking concept. I quite like that in terms of you know how to empower people. So it's that notion of making sure that people get the opportunity to you know learn from themselves. So and it's that about about you know what Freire says is it's really important you've got knowledge to make sense of the world. If you've not got knowledge. You know, essentially activism is just blah 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 so it's that bit about to be an effective activist whether you're a young person or a residential manager in that kind of world of of kind of uh, new public management you know it's that bit about having to have the, the correct language and use it the correct way to be able to agitate and empower successfully and i think that's the key here depending on what context you're in yeah absolutely and i think in that sense we need to be really conscious about how we use the term empowerment because i'm completely with catherine that sometimes people just use it because it's convenient language because it's used 
quite a lot and it would be would be wrong to say like oh, actually we don't empower people that's even worse yeah um but similarly i think in in some countries i'm very mindful that um empowerment isn't necessarily seen as a social pedagogical um theory as such because um it's been perhaps co-opted by um psychological thinking that just focuses on the individual and what can we do to support the indi individual to feel a little bit better about the power differential within society and as i hope we've we've touched upon enough that's important but that's not good enough in social pedagogy as Jamili says we think about the connection between the individual and society and what we can do to kind of create the dots around to to support people to feel more socially included um to feel more engaged in what we what we shape society to be um and so we need to also look at the transformative aspect at what can we do to kind of really change the status quo of how power is distributed and not just say that actually if you're poor if you're suffering from social inequality then we'll just empower you a little bit so that you feel better that's not social pedagogy that's the starting point of a social pedagogical journey to try and create the conditions in which people feel empowered but have actually meaningful power within society if that makes sense um so I'm very curious um, to, to hear from anyone else any further reflections and to also invite you to just put any key learning points from the session today into the chat so that we can pick up on those and uh, try and visualize um, some of the key messages from each of the webinars. We still need to do that at some point, um, but yeah, feel free to chip in. Can I just add yeah. something? Um, obviously, I have residential background myself, and we spoke in our group about um, it was lovely to see that that you know you've got this stigma or this um, that night shift workers are night shift workers, and that's it. And it was really nice to see that June was taking a key role within that young person, and like you said, that this kind of the opportunity was there um, from Joe and you know um, and the empowerment itself is there in the scaffolding but for me the key thing was the night shift worker because I've came from the residential background and there is this bit about you know night shift workers are just there for that one duty and don't really get involved um, with care planning and young people but they have such a significant part to play and um, coming from that's my own personal experience because I kind of try to promote some of the things that you know like Joe was doing just now that it was the crucial role and kids you know will open up to whoever the relationships with um, and that you know that, that was lovely to see I really like that and um, partly about the nature of work. Yeah Sorry. absolutely and it pointed out the fact that we need to think about the structures that we have slightly differently and find ways to to kind of make things happen despite the structures and not say like oh actually if you're a night shift worker you can't possibly work any other hours than what you usually do but to actually go let's let's find out how we can make this happen so that it works for, for both June and the girl she was supporting so yeah there is there is lots in there um to to learn and to recognize the that night shift workers have an amazing set of skills and talents as well. Um, so, yeah, that would be a good example. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Jamil, you asked the question here about what do people feel about the way strengths has entered the lexicon of practice. Would anyone like to respond to that? And we'll end on that point. Should I say something? But um, I think it's like everybody needs to feel they have strengths. Um, and I think, again, it's like this, this kind of difference we were talking around individually in our personal relationship, whether it's at work, whether it's 
between you know a night worker and and a, and a young person between a manager and their staff like so it's really important and we really have the power to highlight each other's strengths and see somebody you actually really like art or you actually can think outside whatever it is um but i think there is also the recognition and that's very much like one thing that I'm experiencing now in my like supporting young people is that if those young people, that young person is in a situation where structurally, socially, there is very, very little that he can do, it's actually very difficult for him to experience his strengths. And that it may be because it's the way that um, the relationship I have with him is it's actually not professional. I used to work with him and I kept on like seeing him for, for a long time. But actually um, now, like I can't, I can't really empower him because he's a grown adult and his social situation is very, very disempowered. Um, and so it's very difficult to see to, for me to help him see strengths. And I, I think it, I would like to kind of talk a bit more about the situation. So I think, again, it's like that needs to be taken with like a, you know, quotation mark and being taken very, very carefully because the context is still very, very important. And if I was working with him as a social worker or in a different setting, I might be very, I might be able to show him his strengths in a very different ways. So I think, again, it's kind of like, there is always, for me, this kind of personal individual relationship, but then the wider, the wider context. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I think that that's important because context really matters. If, if we take anything from this webinar, it is about that relationships matters and context matters because strengths don't exist out with a context. So what is a strength in one context? might be a weakness in another context. So we, we always need to create the conditions in which people can experience their strengths and develop them further, but not just pretend that strengths are just like a tool, you either have it or, or you don't, because then we think in the same way as we think about power, as you either have it or you don't. And we need to get away from thinking about power as something that we need to take away from others in order to have it, and to think about it in terms of something that we can actually share and it multiplies. If that makes sense. So um, I would like to just take this opportunity then to, to draw this to a close and to thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll be back with more webinars over the next coming months and um, have some really fascinating topics. So next time we'll be speaking about human learning systems with some amazing contributions. Um, we'll be exploring human rights as an important area of social pedagogical practice and um, focusing on communication theory with the four aspects of a message, which is a fascinating uh, model that's used quite a lot in Germany. Um, so I hope to see you then again and would like to thank again June and Joe and Georgina and Cecile in particular for your contributions and you all for joining and uh, taking part in this. So have a great time until then. See you again soon. <laughs>